Good morning. Good morning. For everyone who has a garden, it is a beautiful day. The rain is falling. This morning I want to ask you a question. Actually, two questions. What are your priorities? What are your priorities in life? What are your top priorities in life? And what makes you happy? Usually those two things go together. The top thing on your list to do and the thing that makes you happiest are tied together. Back in the mid 80s, back in my days as a Methodist and a Methodist preacher and pastor, I had a sermon opening that I used at a number of churches. It was an interactive opening. I asked them to raise their hand at the response to a number of questions I had. I don't want you to raise your hands today, but I'm gonna ask the questions to you. Do you happen to have a favorite sports sport that you like? Whether it be baseball or NASCAR or football or soccer or tennis or whatever it is, do you have a favorite sport? And I would ask these congregations and man, people would raise their hand. They were so happy. At one church that I was a member of, the preacher actually had a little bell in the pulpit and if Duke won a ball game, he rang the bell for Duke. So I was, actually, I was actually in high cotton when I started down this trail. I ask another question. Do you happen to have, if you have a favorite sport, do you have a favorite team? People lit up like Christmas trees across the room. It was like asking a third grade class a question and watching them want to give answers. They wanted to stand up and testify as to what was their team and how much better it was than your team. And I asked then, do you happen to know the starting lineup of your favorite team? Oh man, beaming, happy, smiles upon every face. And then I said, I want to ask another question. How many of you are Christians? Everybody's hand went up. We're still, we're still right up here high and going. And I said, well, I want to ask a couple more questions and I don't want you to respond. I don't want any hands up. I don't want any heart failures or anything like that. How many of you can name the 12 disciples? And Judas, let's just leave him out. And people's smiles went from great, big, beautiful, happy smiles to terror. Several people tried to become invisible sitting in the pew, closed their eyes, hoped I would go away, was worried that I might call and say, would you mind standing up, you know, and tell us, did us the list. And I said, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, you know, Mark and Luke aren't in that number. And by the way, here's another question. Can you name the disciple who was elected to replace Judas? And I wouldn't give them the answer. It was a game changer. So what are the priorities in your life? In today's gospel, we find Jesus being tested by a scholar of the law. Sometimes you hear them referred to as scribes. When you hear about them in the gospel, they're usually a problem Jesus is dealing with them. They're not generally in good favor. There's one occasion where, where one does and says the right thing. But as a rule, scholars knew the law backwards and forwards and upside down, and their priority was the observance of the law. And this scholar asked Jesus a question. He knew the answer to the question because it came from the law. He says to Jesus, he calls him teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The $64,000 question for everyone. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus put it back on him with the law, put it back into his area of expertise and said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? And the scholar replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. 
But the scholar wished to justify himself. He had to have a reason for asking Jesus a question, the answer that he already knew. And so he takes it a step further and says, who is my neighbor? Now for us, the word neighbor tends to be somebody we like. Now yes, there's usually somebody on the street that maybe gives us a hard time. But generally, a neighbor is someone who is somebody we like. We might dislike them, but generally we don't generally just loathe them. So Jesus goes radical here. Jesus takes it to a place this scholar of the law never thought he would go. He tells a parable about a man who fell victim to robbers. He was traveling down on foot, of course, the 17-mile road between Jerusalem and Jericho that drops 3,300 feet from one spot to the other. It was a dangerous way, and it was not unusual for someone to be beaten and robbed on that section of road. The man is left for dead. We're told half dead. A priest happened to be going down that way, and he saw him. But he didn't just walk by. He went to the opposite side of the road. Likewise, a Levite came by, realizing, of course, in Jewish law, if you had contact with a dead body, you were unclean. This could cause a problem for a priest or a Levite doing their job as such. So their priority was, again, like the scholar, the fine points of the law, not the care and keeping of a fellow human being that may be dead or may be dying. You would think that the next logical person that Jesus would have come down that way would be another Jew. But it's not. It's a Samaritan. Now we know that Samaritans and Jews didn't like each other, but it went much deeper than that. These people were at enemy with one another. It went way back. The Jews considered them to be an illegitimate race. They had been mixed blood after the exile. They also only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. They also worshipped on Mount Gerizim and not in Jerusalem at the temple. And it goes much deeper. About a hundred years before Christ, the Jews razzed the temple on top of Mount Gerizim. And in response to that, the Samaritans went to the temple during Passover and strewn bones of dead humans in the temple to defile and desecrate it during that holiest of times for them. So they hated each other's mortal guts. That's where it went. And so after Jesus tells the story, he gets to the point where the Samaritan comes and he not only goes to the aid and comfort of the man, he pours wine and oil in the wounds. That costs money. Apparently he knew something about medicine, so he's employing his, his, his talent and his money. And he took his time with the man. He puts the man on his animal and carries him to an inn. He puts him in the inn, and the next day, so we know he spent at least 24 hours with the man of his time, he gives him two days' pay, two silver coins, to the innkeeper and tells the innkeeper, take care of him. And then he gives him a blank check and says, if he needs anything else, when I come back, I'll pay for it. And he's going to follow up. And so Jesus then asks the scholar, who is the neighbor? Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? And the scribe answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Listen to that really carefully. The one who treated him with mercy. They hated the Samaritan so badly they didn't like to use the word Samaritan. He didn't even respond with the person as a Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So think about your life this morning as you think about your priorities and the things that you do. Jesus tells us the most important commandment. He says this several times in the gospel. The most important commandment is to love God among all things, everything. God is the center and the effect and everything in your life, period. Is that the way it is with you? 
Is Jesus the center of your life? Is God the center of your life? When things you have to prioritize, getting things done, where does God fall on the list? And then loving your neighbor as yourself. Do you love your neighbor as yourself? We all love ourselves. What are we doing for our neighbors? Yes, I love my neighbor, but what are we doing to show love to our neighbor? In the Catholic Church, we have a list of items called the corporal works of mercy. They come directly from our blessed Lord, and they come directly out of the Old Testament as well. Things like caring for the sick, which the Samaritan did here. Things like visiting those in prison, which can be the prison of a person's body in old age, in a nursing home, or shut in in their own house. We have the St. Anthony ministry for that. If you'd like to do that, see me after Mass. We will put you to work. Feeding those who are hungry. James tells us you, you just can't say, go with God and let somebody go away hungry. Faith without works is dead. It's like soap without water and using it. It's worthless. Taking care of those who are homeless. Taking care of those who don't have clothes. These are the things that are the corporal works of mercy, the physical things that we do for our neighbors. Instead of saying, well, I would do it if one came along, go find one and take care of them. Go and look. Don't go to the other side of the road. Place your priorities where they're supposed to be. Then there are the spiritual works of mercy. Those can be uncomfortable too. Fraternal correction of someone who is doing something that may be putting their soul in danger of eternal damnation. Gently correcting them and putting them on the right way. Explaining the gospel to somebody who doesn't know. Taking the time to do that. Sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes that takes many conversations. Think about what you do for fun and what the priorities are in your life. When you're assessing those, think about this gospel today. Putting God above everything and putting our neighbor, those that we love, those that we sort of like, and those that we don't like, and those who hate us on the same level as our love for ourselves. As Jesus tells us, Go and do likewise.